All right, by my clock, it is 12.01 p.m., so we'll go ahead and get started. So my name is Jamil Jaffer. I'm the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute here at George Mason University's Anton Scalia Law School. I'm thrilled today to be presenting uh, the third in a series of four events on antitrust and national security, specifically the national security implications of antitrust. And today we're going to be talking about America's adversaries and what's going on with some of our adversaries in the antitrust realm. Uh, what are we doing? How, does that how do the two relate to one another? So I'm thrilled to have a great panel with us today. Uh, I'm going to go from sort of my left to right. We'll start with Matt Peralt, uh, professor of practice at the University of North Carolina School of Information Library Science, Alex Petros, Policy Council of Public Knowledge, and last but certainly not least, Maureen Olhaus is the chair of Baker Botts, LLP's Global Antitrust and Competition Practice. So just to give you guys a sense of, uh, of, of the way we're going to run this thing today, uh, we'll do about 40. I'll introduce our panelists in more detail uh, before we get started, um, and then we'll do about 35, 40 minutes of questions between me and them, and we'll get, try to get some sparking of conversation going amongst the four of us. Um, and then we'll come to you all for your questions. So as you all are, are listening to the panel, please think of your questions, put them in the Q&A function um, here on the Zoom, um, and we'll take those questions uh, about at about the last 15, 20 minutes of our session. So with that, let's just jump right in. Um, uh, we'll start with Maureen. Maureen, you're the chair of Baker Botts' Global Antitrust and Competition Practice. Your work focuses on antitrust, privacy, data security, consumer protection investigations and the like. You have extensive experience globally on antitrust uh, and the like. In particular, uh, you served, you recently led the, F the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, as acting chairman and as a commissioner, uh, where you ran all aspects of the FTC antitrust work, including merger review, conducted enforcement, and steered all of the FTC's consumer protection enforcement with a particular emphasis on privacy and technology. So you're, you're great for this conversation. You also, by the way, led the US delegation um, on international antitrust and data privacy. Um, and you're the only FTC commissioner to have received the Robert Potofsky uh, Lifetime Achievement Award um, uh, in, in, in this regard. You, in prior in your career, uh, you've been a law clerk at the DC Circuit. You're a graduate of the George Mason University uh, Anton Scalia Law School, before it was named the Scalia <laughs> Law School, um, and UVA, and, uh, and you've testified over a dozen times before Congress. So Maureen, thanks for being with us. Uh, Jamil, thanks so much uh, for having me. Really delighted to be here. Wonderful. Uh, we're also joined today by Alex Petros. Alex is a policy counsel of public knowledge. Uh, at, po at public knowledge, Alex focuses on digital platform competition issues. His portfolio includes things like interoperability, non-discrimination, and the potential creation of a new digital regulator. We'll definitely talk about some of that today. Um, he's written several blogs on a variety of topics, including acquisitions during the pandemic, food delivery, e regulations, and music mergers. I mean, what a diverse range of items that he's talked about. Um, Alex has worked in public service for a long time prior to coming to public knowledge. He served Senators Amy Klobuchar, Richard Blumenthal, and Joe Donnelly, as well as on the House Committee on Government Oversight and Reform and a number of political campaigns. He has a law degree from Georgetown and a bachelor's degree in economics and political science from Yale. Alex, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Looking forward to getting started Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Awesome. And last and certainly not least on my introductions, Matt Peralt. Matt, as I mentioned earlier, is a professor of the practice at University of North Carolina School of Information Library Science. He previously led the Center on Science and Technology Policy at Duke and was a professor of practice at Duke Sanford School of Public Policy. He previously worked at Facebook where he ran public policy and was the head of the global policy development team. He covered issues ranging from antitrust to law enforcement to human rights and oversaw the company's policy work on emerging technologies like AI and virtual reality. In July, 19, July 2019, Matt testified in front of Congress on, competitive, on the competitiveness of the technology sector He's also been a counsel for the Congressional Oversight Panel, a consultant at the World Bank, and a law clerk for the, for the D.C. District Court. Maureen was the Court of Appeals. Matt was the D.C. District Court. He holds law degrees, a law degree from Harvard, uh, a degree from Duke University, Stanford School of Public Policy, and Brown University. So, Matt, thanks for being here with us, too. Thanks so much for having me. So, as you can see, audience, we've got an amazing, an amazing uh, group of folks. So, Maureen, I'll start with you. Um, you know, you served in senior roles in the federal government. We've talked about it, FTC commissioner, acting chair. You've been a leading lawyer in this space, testified for Congress. You've also spent a lot of time thinking about China, right? And the way that China uses its antitrust laws, the impact of its policies, antitrust and elsewhere, including on IP, on America's economic and national security. So if you could, let's set the stage for today's discussion, right? We've heard a lot of talk recently about, you know, China using its own antitrust laws to go after Jack Ma and Alibaba. Um, at the same time in the U.S., we've heard American politicians on both sides of the aisle talk about the problems with big tech, the need to go after big tech and address antitrust and other issues with them. Um, talk to us though about China's antitrust laws, because this is a session about America's adversaries. 
How do they work? What's going on with the use of their laws? And how should we be thinking about the way that China's doing antitrust in the context of our conversation here in the U.S. about national security, economic security, and, and our own antitrust laws? Uh, well, th thanks, Jamil. I'm happy to talk about that. I focused a lot on uh, the interaction uh, with our uh, the uh, Chinese antitrust agencies when I was commissioner and chair. I actually went to China. Oh my gosh, I, I lost count more than ten more than ten times, uh, yeah. and uh, have spoken uh, extensively on, on these issues. Now, the Chinese anti-monopoly law. Um, interestingly, um, specifically expressly provides for the consideration of non-competition factors. Mm. Um, for, so for example, the law says um, that it was enacted for among, among other things, quote, promoting the healthy development of the socialist market economy, end quote. <laughs> and really that could mean a whole range of things, the, the protection of jobs, uh, Chinese state-owned entities or the other foundational aspects of a socialist economy. And the extent to which Chinese enforcers, antitrust enforcers, consider um, these kind of factors is ultimately a matter of discretion. Uh, yeah. And also whether there's um, pressure from outside the agencies to consider non-competition factors is, is somewhat opaque. Uh, but, but some of the um, issues that we've seen and, and um, folks have raised, um, for example, the U.S. Chamber did a, did a study uh, that suggested uh, that uh, there was um, a little bit of a, uh, a gating factor happening in hmm. China where uh, U.S. or foreign, I should say, foreign companies would have to file, uh, you know, much like we have a HSR filing regime, they would have to file uh, for mergers, and a lot of those uh, might get challenged, or a certain percentage right. might get challenged, but uh, Chinese entities were not filing, right? So you may end right. up with a statistic that says, oh, well, you know, we, we challenge X number of deals, and that's kind of commensurate with, uh, you right. know, other enforcers around the world. But if like your home team <laughs> doesn't have to file for, for review, right. then that can uh, tilt the playing field somewhat. Right. Um, we've seen issues involving, uh, there was a merger uh, that the entities were not present in China. They sold, they sold into China, had to do with copper. Uh, right. And uh, China was the only um, agency that challenged it. It took more than mm -hmm. a year to review it. And uh, what they required was that there be a divestiture of a copper mine in Peru. Uh, and then the buyer of the divested asset was a Chinese consor consortium of companies, including state-owned enterprise. So those are some of the kind of tools that you could see kind of used through the Chinese antitrust law. And again, their law specifically provides for this. So yeah. I'm not saying that, you know, that uh, is necessarily, um, you know, outside their law, but, but it does. And then we've certainly yeah. seen actions involving intellectual property proposals to require an essential facilities doctrine to have mandatory licensing at certain rates. So when you have a right. compulsory licensing and then a um, unfair pricing uh, provision, you put those two together and you can have mandatory licensing at rates that are favorable for Chinese right. companies that are implementing uh, these uh, these technologies. So those are some of the kinds of issues that we've seen arise. Look at, but uh, you know, the Chinese enforcers do want to be seen as being, um, you know, in in um, you know adherence in accordance with uh, international right. antitrust standards. Um, so so they are, you know. They they do attempt to have some transparency. They do you know uh, you know they engage a lot to talk about these issues. Yeah. But th I think there are some continuing concerns th that uh, that happen about. Yeah. And I'll just finish on this last point. When we talk about national security policy and antitrust mm -hmm. in the U.S., we're usually thinking about like you know espionage and insights into you know real secrets and you know th right. things like that a access to networks that can be used you know to, to monitor th things like that but it, Chinese officials that I've talked to they see national security as a broader concept that has to do mm. with economic security as right. well so that that's another thing that we right. see kind of play out in right. the Chinese antitrust analysis interesting so you know Alex uh, one of the things that Maureen mentioned that I think is really interesting is that chi you know China's antitrust laws have this provision that allows the consideration of non-competition factors of course here in the United States 
we don't have necessarily a explicit provision that suggests that or even in, in, our, in our sort of traditional antitrust analysis doesn't allow for that. It's primarily focused on, on the competition mechanism. You spend a lot of time thinking about how to, how to, how to either change or apply American law to address the concerns that have been raised uh, about US industry. So I'd like to talk to you about this sort of nexus between what, mm -hmm. what Maureen described about what's going on in China and, and, and their provisions of law that permit uh, these consideration of, of, of these extraneous non non competition factors, um, you know, one of the concerns about China obviously is that you know there's this authoritarian trend. There, you know, Marine mentioned, you know, it's about the socialist market economy. It's in some ways a contradiction in terms, but China's managed to sort of <laughs> find a path forward on that. Um, how do we think about the way that U.S. laws are being talked about today? So in the U.S., we're talking about using our mm -hmm. traditional antitrust laws that are competition focused to address. Concerns of technology industry, some of which are certainly competition focused, but concerns that also go beyond that, you know, concerns about labor, labor rights and concerns about on the left and concerns on the right about political fairness and unfairness. Uh, uh, talk to us about how we should think about the way that we're thinking about U.S. antitrust laws and modifying them in the context of, you know, what China is doing, the way that the provision that China has. And is there any applicability here? Or are we just comparing, you know, apples to grapes? <laughs> so I, you know, I think there is some, but I probably I'm more on the apples to grapes side of things. So, you know, the like short answer is really not a lot. You know, I think we have, you know, as more green is laid out, you know, we have pretty different systems and, you know, quite frankly, pretty different goals in what we're trying to do. Yeah, I don't think currently the U.S., uh, you know, is using our antitrust laws to punish companies for, you know, not towing the party line, nor do I think should we go down that path? You know, antitrust laws, I don't think should be used, you know, for political ends. And, you know, I don't think we're necessarily seeing that. You know, even I'm like, you know, as you could tell from my bio, a dyed in the wool, you know, left, left wing guy, you know, I had a lot of issues with a lot of what the Trump administration was doing, but like, you didn't even really see this with them. You know, I, so I do think, you know, kind of as an overarching point, it is important to keep antitrust focused on protecting competition, you know, yeah. in, in, in where we compete, not so much kind of some of these other ends. But I do think like it certainly can help, but I view it as like an after effect, not a mm. goal going in. So, you know, on the left, you know, that's things like misinformation, dis mm -hmm. disinformation. And as you mentioned on the right, that can be something like, you know, uh, conservative censorship. Right. So, um, you know, I, I do think competition can help with, with that, with the simple kind of maxim that competition can make companies more responsive to you and, you know, your concerns sure. if they're really worried about losing you and if losing you will cost them money at the end of the day. Right. But I don't think, you know, we should say, you know, everything China is doing is reflexively bad just because, you know, China is doing it and maybe they're doing it for the wrong you know, ways to Reasons, go about yeah. it. But kind of my big overarching point is that, you know, if we want to globally compete with, you know, China, other kind of global adversaries, we need kind of, you know, the American secret sauce that, you know, okay. China will, you know, not, you know, ever be able to, I think, really have. And that is good old fashioned apple pie, American competition. Like we want, you know, you know, we're not going to beat China on size of a market or, right. you know, the fact that, you know, the government can, you know, inter intercede as Maureen has pointed out, you know, you have to sell to like this person and, you know, that, that at this price. Right. Yes. Yeah. But I think, you know, we can beat them with innovation, creativity, yeah. like, and I think with that, like we should want robust markets with tech companies, like really adding each other's throats, like, you know, scratching and clawing and really kind of, you know, like a six-year-old with action figures, fight, fight sort of, sort of vibe to it. Uh, you know, we, we really, you know, we want competition. And I don't think that we currently have that. Like we hmm. are, our, our big tech companies, I don't think face the kind of competitive pressure that we want them to face. And with that, I think we can, you know, force them, you know, into disruptive innovation. And that's the kind of stuff that will help us, you know, as as a U.S. as a whole. And yeah. so right now, I think big big tech is incentivized to innovate, but in ways that kind of prolong the dominant status quo, not necessarily disrupt what is going on. And I think, you know, and and, and I think we should realign incentives so big tech is really facing 
competitive pressure at you know at you know as as much as we possibly can, so we can move along. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting, Alice, and I, I do want to ask you a follow up. Um, I, you know, it, it's interesting because in the U.S., we've traditionally thought about our antitrust laws, right, as a tool for ensuring that if you if you have a predominant position in the market, that you can't exploit that position, right? You can't mm -hmm. use it to maintain it. Uh, but what you're describing is, is is something slightly. I think I think, and maybe I, maybe I heard it wrong, but something slightly different, which is. Um, even if you came about that dominant position in a way that was appropriate, and even if you're, use, you're not using it in an exploitative way uh, to retain that monopoly power or that, that predominant power, whatever it might be, um, nonetheless, that we should still create a, a incentive system to, to, to force you down into more competition, even if you're not using it. Do I hear, did I hear you right or am I, am I missing something? Yeah, so I, I, I would say... You know, I, I wouldn't necessarily see that like, you know, big, big tech has grown in this, you know, sun, sunshine and, you know, rainbows way that, you know, I, 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 I do think that there has been some, you know, as, as you can see from the Facebook case, Google case, et cetera, there has been some anti-competitive conduct that has gone on. But I do think, you know, there should be a focus on, you know, what, you know, what's been called bottleneck firms, gate mm. keeper firms, you know, firms mm. that kind of, you know, have a strategic kind of spot where, you know, you, you know, have to pay their, their tolls to go through. I think something yeah. like the internet, we really like to think of it, you know, as part of the promise of the internet is this big, like decentralized place where, you know, anybody can, can kind of come up, you know, out of the weeds. And I don't think that we currently have that. And so I think until you go go after the kind of gatekeeper bottleneck power, we, we won't really be able to move move past kind of I think you know I am especially concerned like I think competition at the end of the day you know is the name of the game and like I yeah. think competition can you know solve a lot of our problems and kind of move forward but I'm you know why I think we need some regulation in this market is that competition isn't isn't really working and and why that is is kind of the you know I talk about the strategic spot like I think you can look at you know something like you know what what speak to me is is this like this mm. you know the like mobile mobile phone revolution where you know a company like I think Google or Facebook should have lost or you know should or like or should have had their products really kind of you know had you know come about of you know this is a real kind of sea change and you know I don't think Google's mobile products were all that great. I don't think Facebook's mobile products were all that great, but I think how they managed to stay on top was anti-competitive conduct. And I think that's the type of thing you should go after. So Matt, this is really interesting. So I think there's sort of two conversations going on here that I really want to sort of get your take on. So, so on one hand, Alex says, look, you know, some of these companies got there because of anti-competitive conduct, right? They did things that would push other people out of the market. That's what American antitrust law is traditionally about. You take, you've got you've got a dominant market position. You're exploiting that market position to push people out, right? So we can we can debate whether that's happening here or not, right? But Alex also made a separate and distinct point, I think. And I, Alex, you can correct me when I when I come back to you if I'm wrong about that. But what I heard and I sort of tried to flesh this out a little bit was that even beyond the exploitative use of market power, right? There's a there's a benefit to creating and sort of maybe ratcheting down these bigger companies to get them into a more competitive space with others, even if they're not using that market power in, a, in an exploitative way in order to create that sort of, you know, competitive market that generates innovation and the like. And, and I wonder, Matt, you know, is that the way that we've, it's at least not the way I think about traditionally some American antitrust law. What do you think about that? If I've got what Alex is saying, right. And, and should we, I mean, you know, there's conversations on Capitol Hill as we all know about modifying the laws to make just such changes. Is that the right approach? And if so, why? And if not, why not? So I, I tend to come down closer to where you are. We, we often think only about the successes, but sometimes forget the failures. Facebook has had tons of failures, for instance, in the in the mobile market. One is the yeah. when Alex held up his phone, it was not a Facebook phone. Um, and for very right. good reason. There are probably many people who forget the launch, the attempted launch of Facebook phone, which did not was not particularly successful. Um, I certainly think we can spend time talking about kind of whether new antitrust or old antitrust is the right path forward. But I do think yeah. coming back to some of the points that, um, that Maureen was mentioning about 
what's going on in China right now. I do think we're at a moment where we actually can evaluate with more rigor what mm. China is doing and what an antitrust reform yeah. agenda looks like and the impact that it has, and then use those learnings to evaluate whether the agenda that has been proposed in the US is the right one. So mm. if you look at what China has done over the last six to 12 months, it's a set of things that I think sound a lot like what Representative Cicilline is proposing, raising mm. the profile of the antitrust agencies, providing them with more resources and more prominence, more aggressive merger review, including striking down mergers that would benefit large tech platforms, stricter enforcement of exclusionary conduct standards, data portability and interoperability mandates, curbing tech addiction, particularly focused on the experience of young people. Um, as Maureen said, considering a broader set of, so, so, of social factors and competition analysis, harnessing the power of corporate giants. So if you've looked at the stock um, prices of large Chinese tech companies in the last few months, they've declined mm. um, significantly and, and their market power, I think, has likely been harmed as a result. That, that package of agenda is actually being implemented in real policy in China right now. It's articulated mm. their proposals in the US, but, um, but, but it has not moved forward. But we have a body of policy interventions right now that we can look at and determine how successful have they been or not. I think it's really interesting when we have conversations about this Almost every conversation I've had about the China experience has been about why America is different. So America is motivated by different things. And I think we can debate, mm. debate that. Are the motivations for antitrust reform in the US different from the motivations in China? Um, right. or, or people have argued that the way that those reforms would play out in the US will be different because the US is different than China is, um, yeah. clearly. And I think that's important as well. Those, those are really important considerations, but independent of differences, China is doing things right now that we are considering. And it seems to me like it's incredibly important that we evaluate how those reforms play out in practice across yeah. really important indicia before we move, we steamroll forward and just assume that they're gonna be the right thing for the United States. Yeah. So Alice, I, I, Maureen, I'm gonna draw in this conversation, but I wanna go back to Alice's because Matt's said some pretty controversial things, right? I mean, Matt's said, and, and I don't wanna put words in Matt's mouth, but I will. Um, Matt essentially said that the de that some of the Democratic proposals uh, in the House, and there's there's one coming out, I think, along the same lines in the Senate from one of your former bosses uh, here in the near future. It, it's just come yeah, out. It is, it is yeah. out now. It's I, out. I think it's yeah, out, right? I, I, so I we're think here. The text is out today, right. actually. So you're talking about the Klobuchar bill that yeah, came we'll out last about, night. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So hot off the presses, Alex. Uh, Matt, but Matt's assertion, you know, and I think your old boss's bill is. Is similar to the, the 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 bill in the House. Um, is that what you're seeing in these bills that are being proposed is essentially what China's antitrust approach is today, and we and, and I take from Matt's perspective, we ought not we ought not apply that approach here in the U.S. Um, or at least watch how it's playing out there and 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 learn some lessons from it. Is that a fair is that a fair characterization, uh, Alex? I'll give you a chance to sort of respond to that uh, that claim by Matt. Sure. So I mean, I think. You know, I think Matt, you know, points out that like, you know, some of the tools are the same, but I would not argue, like, I would not agree that the goals are the same. I think when you look mm. at, you know, the, you know, people on the, you know, Senate bill, for example, you know, you got Chuck Grassley, Steve Daines, uh, Tom Cotton, I, you know, think is that like, you know, these are not, you know, people who are trying to bring about some like liberal social world, world order here. And, you know, I, but I do think that like something like non-discrimination, something like interoperability are kind of lighter touch ways to go about this. And what I really like about hmm. them is that it, you know, targets conduct, it really kind of changes the fundamental structure of a market. So the best firms win out. And what's great is that it's not so much like you know, punishing success or, you know, saying, you know, you know, as Maureen talked about in China, like, you know, company A wins, company B loses. It's whoever, you know, is, is the best should win. Like if you have, I think a true interoperability regime, it's not so much about the size of your network, but the quality you provide. So, you know, that could be, you know, how, you know, responsive you are to my censorship concerns. This, that could be, you know, how, how well you combat disinformation and, you know, mis misinformation. And I think, you know, if, you know, something like the Access Act, which is, I think, but the, but the Senate and a, and a House bill goes, goes into practice, you will very much see that. And you'll see, you know, real, a real competition over quality, not just, Mm -hmm. 
quantity. And I think that'll be really, really good. So Maureen, I, I want to bring you to this because you, you've seen some of this up close and personal, having been at the FTC. I mean, we've seen this conversation happen before, right? The need for unbundling, the need for granted, you know, guaranteed access, right? And the like. Um, are there lessons to be learned either in the China context from their approach to doing this? I mean, you know, I, I, Alex mentioned that there, the tools are, I mean, I think he conceded at least part of Matt's point, which is the tools are similar. The mean, the ends may be different, but the tools are similar. So are there things to learn either from our own experience uh, here in the U.S. of sort of trying to kind of force uh, or open up a, a previously regulated market or previously a government created monopoly, right, to competition, right? Um, and it's, are things we can learn from the Chinese experience also. And I want to know, Maureen, is there a fundamental difference here? Because in the prior context, I'm talking about the telecom context, right? The government granted those monopolies, right? It was government created. So the government had some obligation to unbundle them and, and, and divorce them. Is it different here where these monopolies have not, or, or not even monopolies, these, these sort of market dominant firms, if we, want to, if we want to take that that view. And by the way, at some point, MySpace would have been thought of as a, as a, as a market dominant firm and so would Yahoo, but you know, here we are um, and, and we know where, where, the, where those two uh, things went. Um, do we worry that we're applying the wrong sort of theory to these cases and that in fact, you know, these, these firms aren't, because they're not using their market dominance necessarily, and there may be exceptions as Alex has laid out, but it are, are, that's not the predominant motivating thing. What you're trying to do is create sort of broader competition as we did it in the telecom context. Does that experience apply here? And what does China tell us about this, if anything? Yeah, so you, there's a lot of threads there. So let me try, try to pull them together. I think the real difference here, what this goes back to the heart of, and I heard this in China, and I actually see this in some of the proposals, it's, it's the difference yeah. between static and dynamic competition. It's the mm. difference between saying, well, the, and I would hear this in China, well, you say we want competition, therefore you need more competitors. The way you get more competitors is you have compulsory access to IP, have compulsory access to private, private assets. Um, and, um, and I think that that's one of the questions here is because in, in antitrust, what, what we've uh, learned over time is that um, dynamic competition is really important because mm -hmm. it's the idea that if you are an entity and you are going to decide where to invest to, you know, to improve your product or a new product line or something like that. If you're going to have to share those benefits with your competitors, you're not right. going to invest as much, right? right? And so you are losing this innovation that happens. Mm. So you may have, you know, a, a structural thing that, you know, someone says like, well, we want a certain market structure. That's what's competitive. But we've kind of moved, we've kind of moved beyond that in the U.S. Mm. And it seems like we're, we're kind of going, we're going back to that. Um, a couple other questions that I have about some of these proposals is also, um, we were talking about making the tech companies compete. The companies do compete with each other. When you think about cloud, right? right. How much innovation and uh, competition has happened but if we are also saying, well, if you are a large, successful tech platform in one field, you can't come now and enter through acquisitions or through mm. you know, investment into a new field and compete with another big tech platform, I, I think consumers are going to lose out from that because I think we've actually, mm. and that's one thing that concerns me with, with, some, with some of these uh, proposals. Um, I also think that uh, when we say competition isn't working, I think you need to say for whom, right? Mm. Uh, in the US, we have a consumer welfare standard. We are looking mm -hmm. at whether competition is providing consumers with goods and products and services. Um, and I'm, look, I'm not saying competition works perfectly all the time. You know, I'm a, I brought merger challenges. I brought conduct challenges. I brought right. the McWayne, you know, uh, supported the McWayne case about exclusionary conduct. Um, but, but I think it's important um, to go back to what the DC circuit said in one of the really important um, antitrust cases involving tech, involving a dominant player in Microsoft, right? Yeah. And so you can continue to compete on the merits if you are a big player, right? And right. so I think we need to be sure we maintain that because we lose the ability, we handicap the ability of big players to yeah. continue to improve their products or compete on the merits I don't think that's going to conserve, uh, serve consumers very well. And so some of my concerns really go back to those kind of fundamental things, you know, structural concerns over dynamic. Yeah. I really am a fan of dynamic, you know, and people uh, 
companies respond to incentives and we wanna be sure that we allow competition on the merits for the benefit of consumers to continue. Right. So Matt, what about that? I mean, it seems to me that, that you know, Alice has made some, some important points, but I think Maureen's response on this question of static versus dynamic competition is a really compelling one. And I think it's, it's I mentioned Alice this, but I wanna get your thoughts, Matt. Like, what do we, what do we make of that? It does strike me that that has been the traditional American approach to competition and for 200 some, whatever, you know, 100 some odd years, uh, hmm. it's worked pretty well, right? We've had very, very, uh, very robust competition. Yes, there have been times at which we've had to address players in the market who use their use their market power uh, improperly, and we've had to, had to deal with them. But as a general matter, this approach, the consumer welfare standard, as well as um, as well as uh, the sort of static versus dynamic uh, uh, approach that Maureen has, has, has laid out, has worked for the U.S. Why why are we talking about changing it now? So, so I agree with the way that Maureen has laid it out. And I think that's consistent, at least with my experience in industry. My, my experience was that there was really aggressive competition, that companies were climbing over each other to try really, really hard to compete. And when problematic news broke about a company's practices, they were scrambling to try to retain their users and change various aspects of their practices because they were worried about the competition. Um, I... So my, my guess is Marine is closer to right and Ale and I'm more skeptical of Alex's point of view. But part of my thinking about this as I've watched what China's done is that I don't think we know exactly what's right. Um, we can kind of speculate based on our expertise. Um, Marine and Alex um, both have vast expertise in this, uh, I think, that dwarfs mine. Um, and 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 have very good reasons for thinking that reform may be a little bit better or potentially a little bit worse. But I think for something like data portability, we actually really don't know. So the Access Act, um, I think, is admirable in many ways, but doesn't wrestle with one of the fundamental challenges of data portability, which is how to do it in a way that's safe and secure. Um, it put, it punts that question to another day, and we don't really know yeah. about the impact of portability in terms of how much will it promote innovation and competition and what privacy and security concerns will arise. And so I would tell you, for instance, there are reasons to be either optimistic or skeptical about various yeah. components of it, but I think I might be wrong. And then the question is, if I might be wrong, what policy tools do we have to learn right. a little bit that's gonna inform right. our process? And one thing that has just been so astonishing to me is we have these tools in lots of different contexts. So OIRA mm -hmm. within the executive branch, for instance, does cost benefit analysis of proposed rules to understand the potential costs and the potential benefits. So Matt, for the audience, is, tell, tell, us, tell us what OIRA is just for the, for the audience. Uh, I think it's the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs um, and they um, sit within, you probably know much more about this than I do, Jamil, but they sit within the Office of Management and Budget and right. then when there are proposed rules, um, they do a cost benefit analysis that I don't think is exactly. dispositive. I think the idea is just, we're gonna to try to understand in more depth, what are the benefits right. of the proposed rules and what are the, right. what are the, what are the costs? Um, right. There is no reform that's on the table now that's cost-free. There's absolutely no reform that's cost-free. And I should say the status quo isn't cost-free either. There's co there are costs associated with the status quo. Sure. Um, but we have these tools that we can use that we use in other contexts to try to evaluate whether the agenda that we're proposing is more likely to be successful or more likely yeah. to fail. As part of that analysis, we now have a superpower that the US is competing aggressively with that is implementing significant components of that agenda and that will have experience with it in a way that we don't right now. So yeah. as much as I think it's interesting for us to pontificate about whether the Cicilline agenda is gonna be good in this way or bad in this way, I really think that we should increasingly look to other markets that are doing this to yeah. understand better what's most likely to succeed and what's most likely to fail. Yeah, I love that. I love that you keep bringing us back to the China conversation. I, I do tend to want to get back to the domestic <laughs> conversation. I'm, I'm glad you're dragging me back to it since this is an event about, about our adversaries. Um, uh, so, Alice, I want to turn to you. And before I do that, I want to mention to the audience, I see we do have some questions in the Q&A, so thank you for that. Please keep putting them in there. We're going to get to your audience questions in about the next five or eight minutes, so please keep putting them in there, and we'll get to them in just a second. So, Alice, I've got two questions for you. Uh, one relates to sort of Maureen's point about the Chinese experience and, and the point that Matt sort of made a little bit, which mm -hmm. is, you know, the Chinese have sort of adopted, at least with respect to intellectual property, sort of the this sort of unbundling required access approach, right? Which is to say, right, we're not gonna enforce those rights. We're gonna do what we want with them and we're gonna see how it plays out. And I think there ha I think it's fair to say that the that the the innovation effects have been problematic. And and it's why the US consistently raises this concern with the Chinese about their their approach to intellectual property. And so does that, is that, should that be a concern to us that sort of unbundling creates the, as a brain laid out, creates the wrong incentives for innovation. Um, and it's not consistent with the American tradition of granting some rights uh, and some, and some 
you know, market success, right? Um, if, if you create this innovative idea. And second, on a related note, right? You made the point earlier that it's not about punishing success or punishing size, right? But on the other hand, you also said, you know, well, if they get too big, right? Even if they're not necessarily leveraging their market power, that itself may be an indicator that that competitors aren't able to challenge them. Or, or and so, so I, is it is it not about size or is it about size? So, Alex, over to you. Okay, so yeah, I, I guess I'll I'll take the first first part first. Um, so I think you know, like IAP is a little bit different than you know data data port portability sort of thing. So I'd kind of draw sure. draw that that dis distinction at first. I mean, I just really you know, question, like, I mean, you know, you always hear like innovation instead of innovation. So if we have one more, you know, regulation in this space and companies will just stop. And I just, I think, you know, I, I think, is it a potential concern? Yes. But do I think it's a little bit overblown and can, and can sometimes stand in the way of regulation that would be good for a market? Yes. I mean, I think, you know, Companies are going to innovate, and I and again, I think we have to look at like this. You know, are we living in this utopia right now? Like, I don't really think we are. Like, I'd argue that the big tech status quo has not been great for for consumers. Like, in the last decade, like, what's the big like disruptive innovation that 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 big tech has come up with that we're losing out on? Like, I guess you can maybe argue like iPhone app store sort of vibes, but like that's, that's, that's over a decade ago. I mean, I, you know, I think you see like marginal improvements to their core products, but, you know, not, but not really like, you know, big, big changes that I, that I'd kind of huh. want to see. And while, you know, I think Maureen's right that there are areas where the, you know, big tech companies compete against each other. I think cloud computing is a great example of that, of, you know, you know, Google, Amazon, or, you know, very, very much competing directly against each other in their core businesses. And like, the, like this is, yeah, Microsoft as well. Um, in their core businesses, there's really not competition. Like, you know, Facebook as a social network, like I don't think Facebook faces competitive pressure from like just about anybody. And, you know, Google, Google as a search engine, I don't think that, you know, they face, you know, that much competition Competitive product like you know Duck Duck Go, you know there's a couple of really kind of mm. smaller entrants, you know Bing obviously, but like they're not really like you know looking in their rear view mirror at that company that's you know like I said coming to eat their lunch, and I think that's like you know when that company is really gaining on them and they're really worried about losing their spot on the top, that is that is when you will see them really be forced to disruptively innovate mm -hmm. and really kind of change the game all to the benefit of consumers at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, well so Matt, 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 you were no, asking sorry, Matt, you, you want to start? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, want to, I, want to, I want to get Matt in, I'm bringing Matt in on this and I'll come back to you, Alice, on the, on the second question. But Matt, sure. I mean, you were at Facebook, right? Like, were you looking in the rear view mirror at your competitors and were you like, what was it? What was it like? You were there. There's not one person who works on a sales team or an engineering team in Silicon Valley who thinks that Facebook doesn't compete with Google and Google doesn't compete with Facebook. So I think one of the sort of interesting things in in watching this debate unfold, particularly in courts, when we think about market definition, is whether the the, the legal landscape agrees with that view. But there's no employee at those two companies who think they think they don't compete. I, I, I think- And what, like, do you, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Because Alice has laid out the argument that look, hmm. Facebook is dominant in social media and networking, social networking. You've got Google doing search. One doesn't do the other. So how yeah, do they- what, what, so, what, what, so, yeah. so, so there's no one who wakes up in the morning and thinks, um, I'm gonna spend some time social networking today. They go to a site like Facebook to consume video or to yeah. communicate with friends or to share information in a particular way. When a site like Facebook goes down as it did last week, you see numbers spike at place, at place on products like YouTube because people are consuming fewer vi videos on Facebook and they're consuming more videos on YouTube. Um, I think one- And like, Google Hangouts versus versus WhatsApp or whatever it might be. Yeah, sure. They're competing for user attention and they're competing for advertising. Those are the sides of the market that they're, um, that, that they're competing for and there's an enormous amount of competition. And again, I, if you walked into a room of Facebook engineers and you said, 
congratulations, you've won, you're not competing with Google, um, you'd get laughed out of the room. That's not, that's not how engineers or sales teams think about their work. Um, I, I also do think, I think Alex's point about innovation is a very, very good one that that's, that term is tossed around as an abstraction. And really, I think to be considered more seriously in regulatory conversations, it needs to, it needs to be much more specific. But, but I do think that companies are taking products off the table all the time solely because of regulatory risk and PR risk. And I don't think that's necessarily a good thing for consumers. Um, one example, I think, of companies being oriented probably in a direction that's problematic from a competition standpoint is that if you read, if you were just like reading the news and you were thinking about what American consumers want in their services, you would think um, they're really concerned about privacy. They want more private services. They want higher quality content and they don't like robots. They don't want algorithms making decisions. They want more control over the information that they see. The biggest competitive threat to companies like Apple and Google and Facebook to emerge in the last five years is TikTok, which is a public model, um, which right. I think arguably has lower quality content. That's disputable, but at right. least my TikTok feed has lower quality content and is driven Maybe by- Maybe it's just really, about you, Matt. Maybe it, it's it might be, about you. Well, that's because it has a really smart robot. So it, you know, the success of TikTok is rooted in um, having a really compelling algorithm that out, that, yeah. that arguably has outcompeted other right. tech companies. So is part of the reason for that, that TikTok has been able to compete so effectively that US companies were trying to optimize for something that was actually not pro-competitive, which was something in a, reg a conversation about on, on the regulatory front about more privacy, fewer yeah. robots, less powerful robots. And the result was that it left space for a different kind of company to emerge. I think that's conceivable. And I think it's something we should keep in mind when we keep counseling people like me, who have a policy background and not a product background, think about what the best products might be for yeah. tech companies to put into the world. Yeah. So Alice, I want to give you a chance to answer that second part of that question um, and to respond to anything Matt said, then I want to come to you, Maureen, and then we'll go to audience questions. So Alex? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll start off with response. Like, I do think like, you know, you can draw a market kind of, you know, where anything that takes up your attention is a Facebook competitor. But like, when you think about it, that market doesn't make any sense. Like your dog is a, is a, is a competitor to Facebook. Your this, this panel we're on right now is competing with, with, with Facebook. And again, I think if you look at core products, like there's not much competition. Facebook has had just about as bad of a month as a company can possibly have of, you know, congressional investigations, whistleblowers, an outage, et cetera. And I don't think it is like much, much affected their, their bottom line because at the end of the day, people have nowhere else to go. Uh, when you look at this, the, the, the stop hate for profit campaign, a uh, year ago, was this, it was this big deal. They even got a coveted public knowledge IP3 award. Like, you know, people were like, this is really changing the game. I hate to break it to them, but like they didn't really do much at the end of the day. Cause again, you don't have anywhere else to go. And so I would, I would keep that in mind. And then, okay, finally, yeah. finally, finally getting to your, to your second, second question on size. So I, I would argue in, in, in this case, it, 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 in, in pretty much every big tech case, it is both size and anti-competitive conduct mm. both um but i think you know how i look at it is i like there are people on my side of the aisle who see these companies as evil and you know companies that like we you know we we you know must must break them up mark zuckerberg wakes up every day trying to undermine democracy and spread covid misinformation i am really not one of one of one of, right. one of those people and i think at the end of the day these companies wake up and they want to make as much money as they possibly can. And, you know, that is the overriding incentive. And I think, you know, in a truly competitive market, that can be good for, for consumers. If, you know, they are, you know, worried about new entrants, if they have competitive pressure, kind of balancing out that, you know, overriding profit incentive, I think you can really find, you know, a market that is, that is good, good for yeah. consumers. They're very much incentive to very much incentivized to innovate and change yeah. and, and, and disrupt to really, you know, keep, keep the, you know, power, power that they have and, and continue to grow. But I'd argue that the market we're in right now is kind of missing that counter countervailing force of like those mm. competitive pressures. And with that kind of that overriding profit incentive has led us led us kind of astray in a in a lot of different areas and i and i'd argue that you know if we reintroduce competitive 
pressure to these markets. We'll like see, you know, everything go go back in balance, and you know, the best companies will win out. And, you know, maybe that's Facebook, maybe that's hmm. Google, maybe that's Apple, Amazon, etc. The companies we yeah. have now. But at the end of the day, it'll it'll be a fair fight, not the kind of biased kind of fight that we have now. So, Maureen, is this all about, as Matt laid out, sort of a market definition? And, and you know, Matt lays out, look, Google and Facebook compete all the time, right? I mean, Google did try to start a social networking capability that didn't, that didn't work out for them. They weren't able to successfully able to do it. But is, is that is it really about market definition or is it about something else? What are we what are we missing here? So I, I think Alex is focusing on one side of a two sided market. OK. Right. And so the other side of the market. Right. So what, one of the things so we often hear this like, well, the problem with the consumer welfare standard and modern antitrust is it's only looking at prices and consumers consume these things for free. So therefore, our tools don't work. And that's not accurate. Right. We actually <laughs> look at two sides of a two sided market. And one Matt talked about is attention. Right. Is people's attention where the other side of the market is advertising. Right. And so, right. so much of this is driven. Uh, I do think they compete with each other for advertising right. dollars. Right. And that's driven a lot of the the um, profitability here. Yeah. Right. So so I think so I think we, we need to, to understand that, too. And so when we do see something like, you know, TikTok uh, take off. Right. Um, and we see, for example, um, new like, uh, you know, kind of new channels where mm -hmm. you know consumer uh, attention is going now i wouldn't i wouldn't go so far as to define something as an attention market right i think mm -hmm. that, that's i agree with alex that's too over inclusive right you know okay. the, my taking a nap doesn't necessarily compete with watching a movie or, okay. or something, you know, something along along those lines um but i think i think we need to understand that these these are two-sided markets one of the other things that i wanted to mention that matt that matt talked about is what we call a uh, revealed preference um, mm -hmm. right so so we we as regulators uh, or as you know in, in enforcers or you know legislators think well consumers must want a B and C right mm. <laughs> but if they are if they are showing we know what they want we know right. what they, if, if we are so that's the, the difficulty I think in designing products and designing markets right, right. In, in a way that's too um, uh, um, heavy handed, right? Because yeah. we, you know, consumers may have very much a different preference that they reveal that they reveal through through their choices. Um, I did want to mention one other thing. Um, yeah. One of the things, so we talked about on um, what China is doing, right? And what there may be, I'm theorizing, but it seems to be from some of the statements that they're, they're doing for their, through their antitrust laws is trying to disperse political power. Right, the party is preeminent in China. They do not want an organization or power source that can rival the party. Right, so I think you need to look at some of this tech crackdown in China it, through that through that lens. I think it's really important. And in the U.S., we have not, in modern antitrust analysis, used antitrust as a tool to. Uh, disperse political power. You go back to the progressives 100 years ago, that's one of the things that they wanted to do. And I think we're starting to see that come up. And I think that's one of the things that is driving some of the populist concerns in antitrust and why we're seeing support against a handful of big tech companies um, from sort of populist wings of both sides of the party with, you know, mm. the Republican side being because of concerns about, you know, bias against conservative speech. One of my concerns is as we look at these bills and we articulate like, okay, well, we want to make sharing and we want to have this and uh, portability and accessibility and you're not allowed to favor your own products and you can do this and that and da, 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 da. You know, the idea that we're going to contain this to four or five companies it does not seem very likely to me, right? First of all, we already talked about some of the bad impacts that might happen from that, right? Right holding these companies back, holding back pro, um, product innovation is this really, and, and then the follow-on effects for national uh, interests. Um, I do think there's the, the challenge too of, well, now are we going to say, well, that's our policy, right? Outside of mm. five companies, four or five companies. And some of the proposals yeah. that I think are being considered, say for rulemaking by the FTC could expand this much more broadly. 
Yeah. And I think That's we can't we can't uh, lose sight of the collateral effects of saying this is yeah. what antitrust is about now. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really important point. And actually, I said I want to go to audience questions, and I will. So, so Matt, I've got a question for you for the audience. So uh, one of our attendees asked, you know, it's been widely reported, and this goes to Maureen's point, that, you know, China is investing a lot of money in trying to overtake the U.S. in a variety of technology fields, right? AI, you know, quantum, you name it. Um, uh, are you concerned that sort of the potential for increased regulation and, and the compliance that goes along with that will frustrate uh, our ability to be competitive uh, in U.S. companies in particular be competitive against Chinese uh, companies that facilitate this overall Chinese effort to sort of accelerate past the U.S. Uh, when it comes to technology development in the next few years? Yeah, I, I do think that that's a risk. I mean, a lot of the debate in antitrust now is around whether the, the we should be more concerned about false negatives, so under enforcement, as opposed to mm -hmm. false positives and over enforcement. I think a lot of people have said we, we may want to tilt toward over enforcement because of concerns that have um, emerged about competitiveness of the U.S. economy. I think right. one argument against moving in that direction is if we over enforce against prominent U.S. companies, um, will that advantage uh, Chinese companies that they're competing with? And, and I do think um, uh, the rise of TikTok is a good example of U.S. companies, I think, being wary of certain regulatory developments and probably taking their eyes off the ball on the potential for something like short-term uh, video. Um, I, I do think the argument, I mean, this is an argument that's been made for a while um, by, the, by the U.S. tech industry. And I think that it, it's I think it's sort of in the midst of a permutation because I think there was a point where you could sort of say, looks like the US is really going to over enforce or is going to enforce more aggressively, maybe it's a more neutral way to say it, mm -hmm. aggress uh, enforce more aggressively against US companies. And China is really supporting its companies. And so Chinese companies are going to outcompete American companies because their government, one government is supporting its companies and one, one government's not. I think the tech right. crash in, in China now makes that uh, argument a little bit uh, more complicated to detangle, hmm. but but I still think there are there are many components of the Chinese tech ecosystem that are being supported by the government right now, and I do think if you see enforcement without strong evidence in the U.S. that will restrain large U.S. companies from competing as aggressively as they can, then that will disadvantage them vis-a-vis um, -vis Chinese competitors. And and I should say that doesn't just mean in the U.S. So it's not just about like is WeChat going to be a very prominent service in the U.S. Right. It's also about U.S. companies being able to compete in lots of other global markets, ranging from like Europe to um, to Asian markets, for instance. And if U.S. companies are prohibited from doing things like acquiring companies that will make their business better, companies in Europe, companies in Asia, for instance, but Chinese companies are not, I do think that's the kind of thing that will tilt the competitive playing field toward Chinese companies and away from you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Alex, I've got a question for the audience. Actually, it goes off something that Matt just at, just talked about. He mentioned sort of this, this the, the sort of Chinese tech clash, right? The Chinese effort to go mm -hmm. up some of their tech companies. And, and one of our attendees asked uh, whether China has an incentive to actually overstate what they're doing on sort of their version of, of big tech, whether it's their in-house companies or, or our version, right? Particularly considering that at home in China, right, a lot of their tech industry is at least partially or, you know, predominantly state-owned or at least state-run. Um, do we do we worry about that? And do we actually, is what we see in China actually them going after the 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 the, the handful of companies that are actually are not state-owned or state or less state influence, perhaps? I mean, that's what we're really seeing in, in, in their in the tech lash in China. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think it's it's a concern. And like, I think it just belies the point that like, these are very different systems. And like, these mm. are, you know, like, I don't think, you know, anyone is accusing our, you know, antitrust enforcement agencies of, you know, going after companies because like, you know, they aren't, you know, helping, you know, the, you know, Democratic Party power or Republican Party power. Like, I mean, I really, you know, I think maybe there's the occasional politician who, you know, might, you know, think that he's doing that. But I think, I mean, I trust in the dedicated professionals at the FTC and DOJ to really not go along with that. I think, you know, even you saw kind of, you know, I you know, love to, you know, poke, you know, poke at the Trump administration for, you know, all sorts of reasons. But, you know, the, you know, Google and Facebook cases, which were both brought under, you know, Trump, Trump appointees, like in there is not like, you know, screeds against, you know, you were, you were mean to President Trump, 
et cetera, it's, you know, pretty, pretty well founded anti trust law of, you know, here, you know, this, this, you know, in anti-competitive merger with Instagram and WhatsApp, et cetera, you know, the, you know, the contracts Google has entered into with, you know, Apple and, you know, others, like, I mean, it's, it's a pretty, you know, well, well grounded thing. And so I am, I'm not that concerned. Like I haven't really seen us go down that path. And so I'm not all that, all that concerned there. well, let me ask this, Maureen, because because you know Alex Alex has made this point I think a couple of times, which is you know this it's not politics that's motivating what's going on, but of course you know he mentioned on on some of these antitrust bills you see people like Tom Cotton and and Chuck Grassley right, and these are not people who traditionally would have been viewed as sort of interested in regulating any industry, much less sort of a, a highly innovative industry like the technology industry. What is going on here? Is it is it in part about politics? Right. Let's posit, as Alex has said, that the career professionals at DOJ and, and FTC are doing their jobs the right way and that they're trying to make the best case for you know what they've been told to pursue but in part isn't our 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 sort of decisions about what to pursue and in particular decisions about how to modify the law we talked about the Klobuchar bill uh, and and the bill in the house do we worry that those are being motivated in large part or at least in significant part by Political concerns on the on the right about about the way that tech companies are handling whether it's Trump or or you know uh, you know uh, censorship or the like, and on the left uh, by not just pure interest concerns, but about labor and 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 you know big you know large companies and the like, and, and sort of the the quote unquote evilness as Alex laid out about uh, uh, some of the the view of that some of these companies are evil. I mean, Marine, how much of this is about politics in your view, and how much of it is really about traditional classic antitrust and market power and competition well um jamil when you listen you know you you observe the debates and you see kind of what people are saying um there are republicans not the majority but some republicans explicitly expressing that that's what they're doing right that they're you know, concerned about suppression of conservative viewpoints by private companies uh, and therefore, the answer is these antitrust bills, right? So, so I, I'm not trying to put words in people's mouths, but I think you just have to look at what they themselves have have said. Yeah. Um, so, um, I, I do think that is a field from what antitrust enforcement is supposed is supposed to be in, in the U.S. Uh, we, you know, the Supreme Court says the um, the solution for speech you don't like is more speech. <laughs> <laughs> right. 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 Um, not uh, necessarily regulating the platform that is carrying or not carrying the, the speech, the speech that you want. Um, so, I, so I think that that those raise some really, really interesting uh, issues there, because, um, again, kind of saying, well, can this be contained to this tight handful of companies that, you know, are in the, the crosshairs or is this really a recipe for this propagating not just in the U.S., but throughout the world, yeah. right? Because that's yeah. the other thing is, you know, the U.S. has spent decades and decades going around all over the world saying antitrust enforcement is about consumer welfare. Antitrust enforcement is not yeah. industrial policy. Antitrust enforcement requires due process, even-handedness, not non-political considerations, you know, economics, consumer welfare. And when we step away from that, we may not like what comes back at the rest of the American economy. Because companies, you know, countries may say, well, okay, we're just following we're your it. lead. Yeah. And yeah. we're not going to limit that to a few disfavored companies. We're gonna we're gonna apply that quite broadly. And I think yeah. that should be a big, big concern for everyone. Well, it's a great point, Maureen. And I think we'll we'll end there as we're coming to the top of the hour. So thanks to Maureen, Alex, and Matt for being here with us. Thanks to all for joining. Uh, please put on your calendars our fourth and final panel in this series. Uh, the National Security Implications of Antitrust, The Home Front. Uh, we'll be doing that on December 9th, 2021. Uh, the link to register is in the chat. We'll hope to see you there. Also, don't forget to find us on LinkedIn. Follow us on Twitter, at Mason Natsek. And check out our podcast, Fault Lines, Iron Butterfly, in cooperation with the Amazing Women Intelligence Community, and NSI Live. Thanks again to our panelists, and thanks to all of you for being here. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks.